in the 11th chapter here of uh, 2nd Corinthians you'll notice uh, somewhat uh, out of the ordinary for sure as to the way that the Apostle Paul uh, identifies himself and maybe more accurately the way he identifies what he's affixing to do in this particular chapter Notice here in verse 1 he says, as uh, Patrick read a few minutes ago, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. So he obviously is talking about right here at the very beginning that what he's doing is out of the ordinary. You know, this is not something that's a practice of his, but what he's going to be doing is going to fulfill a, a, a opportunity, a teaching mechanism in order to make a point. And the point that he's going to be making is somewhat foolish. Now, he does make that point, but he identifies what he's doing as being a foolish thing to do, or maybe better, to have to do. Well, what was the reason for acting in such a foolish fashion? Well, he was having to defend himself. Because people did not appreciate the stand that he was taking against their sin, then they were beginning to question whether he is even an apostle. I mean, the very idea, he, he's not around with the rest of the apostles back there before the, before the cross. They were even going so far as to question his authority because, after all, all the rest of the apostles had wives, but Paul didn't have a wife. So he's questionable because he doesn't have wives. There's all kinds of reasons why we all not trust this guy because, after all, when you look at what he's doing, he's... He's, he's exposing our sin, and he's making us feel bad about ourselves, so let's attack him. And just maybe then that will do away with the truth that he's preaching and teaching. Well, of course it won't. And so what he ends up doing later on down here in this devotional reading is he does somewhat of a bragging episode. And he talks about all these different things in which he excelled all the rest of the apostles. He suffered more than all of them combined. And we even know, he even uses the same terminology in the midst of that, talking about the things he's doing. I speak as a fool, you know. I wish I didn't have to do this. And this is pure folly on my part. But I'm forced to do it to defend my apostleship. Because he knew, as well as we should know as well, that in their rejection of his message, it was not in any way, shape, or form going to remove their obligation to the truth that he preached. And so he says, bear with me while I do this. Well, that's sort of the basis for this particular lesson. It maybe fits in that same category of maybe tongue-in-cheek, you know, and, and, and hopefully as we go a little bit further, then you'll understand what I'm talking about. As this is, a, I think, a, a pretty good lesson to follow up on the one that we talked this morning relative to the reality, the reality of hell and the eternal nature of hell as well. From time to time, you'll find people who will say, you know, if, if you'll just look close enough, it might take a little while, but if you'll just look close enough, you can find good in anything. Now just take your time and and especially before you speak, you look until you have exhausted all the possibilities of looking because in reality, you can find some good in it. You know, there's a fellow that uh, my kids grew up watching on television. He was probably around when I was a kid, but uh, our television didn't get him. He had a good first name, Fred. His last name was Rogers. And he'd say things like, everybody's special. You know? Well, obviously, he'd never been to Walmart, you know. <laughs> Because if he'd been to Walmart, he'd have seen real quick, ain't everybody special. There's some just about as far from special as they can possibly be. There's another guy by the name of Will Rogers. I don't know if they're kin or not. I don't believe they spell their last name the same either. And he said, I never met a man I didn't like. Well, obviously, he didn't get out much either. Yeah. And I've even had people to tell me, and probably some right here in this building that I, you know, They'd say, well, if you can't say something good, just don't say nothing. You know, have you ever been told that? Did they give you a book, chapter, and verse for that one? I dare say they didn't, did they? If you can't say nothing good, just keep your mouth shut, you know. Well, where is that? Back over in Second Hezekiah 3.10 or something in the Old Testament? 
Where is that passage of Scripture? Yeah. You see, the mentality behind all those things, while we may be guilty of maybe saying or thinking one of them, or maybe we be, may be guilty of, of thinking them all, is that in reality, there is really good in everything. And since this world is so eat up with bad, and there's so much bickering that does exist, then maybe a little bit more silence is where we need to go. Well, we've already said, you know, and maybe as recent as last week, that sometimes it really is the case that silence is golden. But we've also made the statement that sometimes silence is not golden at all. It's a, off a little bit of a tent. It's yellow. And it simply is an indication that people are cowardly and will not say what needs to be said, you see. You sort of have a hard time fitting that pig in that hole, don't you? If you can't say something good, don't say anything, can you? When sometimes it's a sin to keep your mouth shut. It really is. But let's go back to that idea then about if you'll look hard enough, you can find something good in anything. Maybe, maybe that topic that we studied this morning, maybe... If we was to look real hard at hell, then we could find some good at it. And I'll tell you something. There's people in this audience fanning right now that ain't never fanned a day in their life. And I'm going to go over here and look at somebody's problem. <laughs> 73 degrees. We got electricity. That's ridiculous. <laughs> So if there is something to the, the idea that if you look hard enough, you can find something good in anything and everything, then that would mean, would it not, of necessity, that if you look long and hard enough, you can find some good in hell? Well, sure. I mean, if we're going to take that overall encompassing statement and apply it to everything there is, then we would have to admit that it would have to apply to hell, wouldn't it? And you know what? I got thinking about that. And maybe there is something to this idea. If you look long and hard at anything, you can find good in it. Because in reality, there are some things that are noticeably absent in hell that people absolutely despise here upon this earth. And therefore, in that respect, there are some very attractive things in hell for those people. Now, that's not going to give us a whole lot of solace throughout eternity, you know, where the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. But nonetheless, there are some noticeable things absent from hell that people seem to despise here. So in that sense, I guess hell would be looked upon as attractive to them. Think about it. One thing that's going to be noticeably absent in hell that some people just don't like much of here on this earth is there's no faithful gospel preaching in hell. Now, there was faithful gospel, gospel preaching prior to these individuals ended up in hell, but obviously they didn't pay any attention to it, and now they are in hell. But there's no such thing as faithful gospel preaching in hell. You mean there are people who despise faithful gospel preaching? Not only that, friends, they despise the fellows who are faithfully gospel preaching. That's the preachers. There ain't going to be any of them there either. No gospel preaching in hell. You know, ever since the first century, we find older gospel preachers like Paul telling Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears who will turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. You see, Paul clearly says here that it is the obligation of faithful gospel preachers to preach the word when it's convenient and when it's not. It's the obligation of faithful gospel preachers to preach the word when people want to hear it and even when they don't want to hear it. They have the obligation to reprove, to rebuke, and, of course, in a positive light, to exhort or encourage. But it is the obligation and has been, since there was such a thing as gospel preachers in the first century, to afflict the comfortable and to comfort the afflicted. But you can take great comfort in the fact that in hell you don't have to feel that no more. No more faithful gospel preachers. 
no more faithful gospel preaching. Nobody telling you you need to show up for Sunday night services, need to show up for Bible classes on Sunday morning. No more telling you you need to be here on Wednesday night or during gospel meeting and vacation Bible schools. Nobody's going to be telling you that in hell. That's all going to be a thing of the past. Boy, don't that sound like an inviting place to be? Where you don't have to be made to feel guilty for simply not doing what you could have done and you just didn't do it. Good old hell. No more faithful gospel preaching. You know how they are. They make you feel guilty when you simply don't do what you have the ability to do. Well, we've asked the question oftentimes, you know, how, how is a person supposed to feel when they simply refuse to do what they have the ability to do? You go all the way back to the first century and wherever the gospel went, and faithful gospel preachers and faithful brethren went pestering people with it, didn't they? Matter of fact, there in Acts chapter 8, after the martyrdom of Stephen, it says that the disciples went everywhere pestering people. No, they went everywhere preaching the word. They went everywhere sharing the message of salvation. On the job, in the marketplace, wherever they went, they went bothering people. Well, folks, that will be a thing of the past in hell. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Nobody's going to come beating on your door and trying to get you to come to a gospel meeting. Nobody's going to be calling you on the phone and asking you where you've been for the last four weeks. Nobody's going to be doing that anymore. anymore. That will all be way back under sometime. Now, you'll be safe and secure in the devil's hell and not have to worry about that pestering group of people ever again. Maybe, just maybe, the absence of faithful gospel preachers in hell is one of the reasons why many people want to go there. Because they despise that type of thing so much while here, do they not? Now, secondly, another thing that's going to be noticeably absent in hell is that nobody's going to be asking for your money anymore. Nobody's going to be expecting you to make any contributions. It's not going to happen. Nobody's going to quote from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 where Paul used the poor saints of Macedonia and held them up as an example of those who first gave themselves and then their pocketbooks naturally followed. And he held that up before the eyes of the rich brethren in Corinth and says, y'all need to give like that. You don't have to worry about them comparisons anymore in hell. It's not going to happen. No more contributions will be expected out of brethren ever, ever again. Now, obviously, sometimes people have a rough road to, to hoe here upon this earth and get in difficult straits, and the Lord understands that. Therefore, it is the obligation, always has been, of faithful children of God to give as they prospered and as they purposed in their heart and to give cheerfully. And while that does not work out to the same amount by, for everyone, it does work out as what God expects out of each, each and every one of us. But that will be all the thing of the past when we find ourselves in hell. No more contributions. Thirdly, there's not going to be anybody calling upon you to live a more holy life in hell. It's not going to happen. There's not going to be any moral sermons preached calling upon a high and holy calling as children of God, you know. There's not going to be any distinctions made between the ways of the world and the ways of God. You're not going to be hearing about the works of the flesh as opposed to the fruit of the Spirit. It's not going to happen. You're not going to hear no sermons or anybody's going to be talking about modesty or social drinking or any of those prevalent things. And all those years that you didn't want anybody interfering with your lifestyle, well, if you'll notice, all those years that you wanted to be with the in crowd, you're right now smack dab in the middle of them. How does it feel now? You was too cool to be faithful, and now you're with all the cool people forever and ever in the devil's hell. Swift move, wasn't it? Wasn't it? You see, I've always wondered if we would maybe have a meeting and, and we could determine as a consensus, say, okay, what part of God's standard for holy living can we knock holes in and, and drag down to accommodate people? 
would that ensure that we get more people in the building? And then if we can knock down the standard in one area, then why not just knock it down in the other area? And before long, you ain't got a standard at all. And while you might have a full building, the whole building's going to hell. I don't know what you accomplished then. Not much anything, would you? The benefits of hell. There's also not going to be any more demands placed on your time in hell. You know, you know that you have less time available than anybody else in all the world. But yet some smart aleck says, no, we all have exactly the same amount of time. But they obviously don't know what your schedule looks like because you don't have any spare time. But yet when you realize we all have the same amount of time, then is any wonder that God expects us to use our time wisely and includes in that wise use of our time the willingness to use our abilities and even our time to further the kingdom of God. I don't have time to teach. I don't have time to work. I don't have time to visit. I don't have time to write cards and send them out to those that are in need of encouragement or they've suffered a sickness or a setback. I don't have time. Is the constant cry of those who claim to not have any time. Well, guess what? Now you've got eternity and you wish you was on the other side of time. No more interference in your time. Man, this place is sounding more and more inviting, isn't it? Is it really? And last and not least, in hell there will be no more invitations. No more invitations. No more invitation songs. You know, how that uh, there at the end of the 11th chapter of the book of Matthew when Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You remember how that, that just tugged at your heartstrings, you know? That it almost encouraged you to let go of the pew and walk the aisle and, and become a Christian. But you showed them. You hung on to the pew. You bull-headed, pig-headed, mule-headed person. You left the building lost, and now you're lost forever in a devil's hell. You don't have to worry about any tugging on your heartstrings anymore, do you? No more invitations. It's all a thing of the past. You see, I'm convinced that when we need to consider these matters is not when it's too late. It's not to realize too late as we are, in fact, in the terrible place that the rich man experienced in Luke chapter 16 in torment or in the eternal abode of the devil and his angels, that the time to realize that these are not really things that we should despise that much is now. And to avoid the certain destiny of those who would despise these things, there's no worship services there. There's no singing out there. There's nobody going to be calling on you, come on now. God didn't say sing pretty. He just said to sing. Nobody's going to be doing that there. That'll all be a thing of the past. But is that what we really want? Is an absence of those things that rub us the wrong way here? Or is it possible that we need an attitude adjustment towards those things that we act as if are against us while here? When in reality... They are for us here. We have to make that decision. And if you're in this audience this evening and have never made the decision to become a child of God, you've been blessed with an opportunity now that you simply will not have in hell. You'll not be called upon to hear the message of salvation, to believe it, to repent of your sins, to confess the name of Christ, and then to be baptized in Christ. That is available for the living. You will not be called upon to repent and return to faithfulness as an Aryan child of God. That's available now. As a matter of fact, that's the responsibility and the opportunity that you have immediately right now. While together we stand and while we sing. upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now what are you saying? 
He's saying these dry bones ain't going to stay dry bones. That knee bone and that shoulder bone and that elbow bone that's all spread out, they're going to come together. The nation of Israel is going to rise from the ashes. They're going to be living, breathing, walking people in the future. There is coming a day in which God will put skin on the top of the sinews as he joins together all these bones that are divided from each other. And I sort of illustrate here. See? Isn't that amazing how I can make them bones get back together? Now, according to God, all these separated bones are going to come back together and they will be restored to Palestine and to Jerusalem. And under the leadership of Nehemiah, they'll rebuild the walls around the city. Under the leadership of Zechariah and Haggai, they will rebuild the temple. And things will be established once again. And for 400 years, they'll be making preparation for the coming of the Lord. You see, what they need to do is what sometimes we need to do as well. We need to look at things from a little bit different angle. Instead of focusing upon the negative things, we need to focus on the positive things. And if it appears there is no positive in what we're looking at, maybe we need to move around a little bit because if we look at it from the other side, it may be altogether different. Now, I can easily illustrate this. And uh, if this, you know, feels as though I'm stepping on your toes, then I'm sorry. From time to time, and I've seen this happen over and over and over again in my short lifetime, here's a person who has watched a morning television show and they're talking about this new disease that is afflicting people, okay? And when you first hear of the symptoms of this new disease, you start thinking just passingly, you know, I've got some of those, some of those symptoms. And then lo and behold, there's a whole segment on Sunday night on 60 Minutes that's dealing with this same disease. And when you hear it twice instead of once, then you realize, hey, I've got some of these symptoms. And then if there's not a segment as well on 2020, and once you hear it three times, you are convinced that this is a disease that you have and you don't have much time left. And then there's an article in Good Housekeeping of all things. And when you read that article in Good Housekeeping, you're thoroughly convinced that you have the disease that is killing millions of people around the world. And then lo and behold, there's a big article in Reader's Digest. You might as well go ahead and buy your tombstone. You're gone. Right? Well, is it possible in a situation like that? And those things really do happen. I mean, I've seen them. Don't make me name names, <laughs> but I've seen it happen. Maybe, just maybe, you need to look at the situation from another angle. For example, while you go to the doctor and the doctor checks you out, he says, yes, you do have some of the same symptoms. But what you need to do is quit eating pizza and chili dogs after 9 p.m. And if you do, drink some Melanta and you'll be all right. Then what do you do? You get mad at it? Oh, no, I wanted to have that disease that's killing everybody around. No, you should be happy. Because you now know the facts of the case, and it's not as bad as you thought it was going to be. You don't have this terrible disease. You're going to live. Well, that's the message that God's people in the days of Ezekiel need to hear. You're going to prosper. Ultimately, this is going to end. You're going to be reestablished as the power in Jerusalem. God is going to demonstrate that you are indeed his chosen people once again. Now, how do you respond to that? Are you thankful? We well, ought to be because the truth of the matter should make you feel a whole lot better. Now, if you want to wall in self-pity, then it don't matter what the truth is. But if you want the truth of the matter and the truth is going to be what determines how you feel about it, then you're going to feel a whole lot better too. Now, think about this. I know people, and very likely you do too, who presently feel when it comes to being a member of the body of Christ that we are very similar to those disjointed bones that Ezekiel is told to preach to. I talk to people and, and uh, all across the country, you know. I get 
bulletins from all over the country. I get magazines from all over the country. And in many instances, the prevailing attitude of many brethren throughout the brotherhood is this. Our bones are dry. Our hope is lost. We're doomed. We're losing numbers. And we'll never be able to be successful again. Woe is we. That's attitude. That's attitude. And of course, sometimes when people have the opportunity to be actively involved in supporting a missionary, they feel as though that maybe in that part of the world the bones are not so dry, but boy, they are right here in Squatch County. There's absolutely no way that we can remedy the situation. Well, could it be that the old good dose of gospel preaching might fix that effort? Well, sure it could. There's indeed a possibility that would be the case. Some people are still having great difficulty getting over this historical fact. And this is before most of our time. Well, I guess everybody's time. But in 1906, the United States government verified that there was a genuine distinction that existed between the Church of Christ and the Disciples of Christ Christian Church. Now, that division had existed for a long time before then. But that was the first time the United States government identified the fact that there was a difference between these two different groups. The Church of Christ is one group, and then the Disciples of Christ, Christian Church, is another group. And there's a real difference between the two, and we'll see that. Well, what happened when that happened? What happened when the United States Census identified this real distinction? Well, here's what happened, folks. Six out of seven congregations in the United States of America went to the left, showing disrespect for the Scriptures and were identified as a part of the Disciples of Christ Christian Church. Six out of seven congregations. Now, if you don't know math, you still see that's a great big percentage. That means that only one out of seven congregations stayed true to the Bible. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, maybe not this generation, but there have been generations before us that wring their hands and said, oh, oh, woe is we, that should have never happened. Oh, we were divided over insignificant matters, which is a bunch of hogwash, folks. But that's the attitude of people who do not have confidence in God's Word. Now, here's some of the things that caused that division. There was the development of a missionary society that said that the church cannot do its mission work. Therefore, there has to be a separate entity that does the mission work of the Lord's church. And while there is no justification whatsoever for such a thing as that in the Bible, it was still looked upon as a favorable thing and caused division among brethren. Secondly, instrumental music and worship was adapted and used as if that's no big deal at all. Even though there is no Bible authority for mechanical instruments of music and worship, those on the left, the six out of seven congregations said, we like it and we're going to have it. And while we cannot defend it in a debate, we want it anyhow and we're going to have it. Thirdly, there became a widespread ecumenical acceptance of those in the denominational world. And what does that mean? That means that if a person claims to be a Christian, even though he's never obeyed the gospel, even though he's a part of a man-made religious organization, we're going to look upon him as if he's a Christian anyhow and extend full fellowship to him. Which means to me, why even exist? Why even try to be the distinct body of Christ if such as that is going to take place. So those are three things, and of course there are many others as well. But six out of seven congregations went that route. Whoa. Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and there's absolutely no way that they can ever get together again. There's an old fellow used to come on the radio. I don't know if he still does or not. I sort of doubt that he does. His name was Paul Harvey, and every afternoon he'd have this little segment called The Rest of the Story. Well, what about the rest of the story? Because sometimes the rest of the story is a whole lot better than the story. <laughs> First of all, the rest of the story is this, that that one-seventh that was left after this huge divide that took six out of seven congregations, that number doubled in size in the next 20 years. That's pretty significant. Doubled in size in 20 years. 
Now think about it right now. What if the Lord's church today made plans and worked to the end that in the end of 20 years we're going to be twice as big as we are now? Why could that not happen? What stands in the way of that happening? Maybe a little determination on the part of those that would like to see it happen but are not out to get involved in seeing to it that it does happen. In the next 20 years, we doubled in size. And that reminds me of a biblical principle. In 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 5 through 9, Amaziah is king. He speaks in the go to battle, and he wants to ensure that he's successful in his battle. And so he tries to hire him more soldiers from the northern kingdom of Israel to fight with him. He wants these extra 100,000 men to go with his 300,000 men and he's willing to pay a hundred talents of silver for them. Everything looks fine and dandy right now, but God sends a prophet to Amaziah and says, Amaziah, I am not with the northern kingdom as I am with the southern kingdom. Now that goes back to what we said this morning about class. All the stuff going on under the leadership of Jeroboam in the northern kingdom it's about like Bible authority. And so the prophet, thanks, thankfully, goes and tells Amaziah, you don't need these guys because these guys are from the northern kingdom and if you take these guys with you from the northern kingdom, I promise you, you're going to be defeated. Now, what would you say if you was Amaziah when a, verse, a word comes back like that? Would you say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for telling me that? That's not what he's saying. You know what he's saying? He said, well, what about the money? I done paid for them. How do people like that get to be in the position of being king in here? I don't know. What about the money? You've just had your life spared by God sending the prophet warning you that if you go into battle, you're going to lose if you take these 100,000 men. And instead of saying, thank you for the information, he says, what about the money? Hmm. Maybe, maybe there's a principle there that we need to understand as well. Because what the prophet then said to Amaziah is this. The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. You mean Amaziah did not have confidence that God would actually carry through on his promises? That God's word is as good as he is? That you can depend upon him. If he makes a promise, he carries through on his promise. And that God will allow us to be successful in what we're supposed to be doing. Maybe I didn't believe that. Do we believe that God is able to give us more than this? You know? Do we really believe that if we commit ourselves to what God has commissioned us to do, that we can, in fact, be successful? Or do we need to hire... 100,000 yahoos from another country to help us out. Oh no, oh no. Now here's the principle applied. God is able to give us more than that. In the yearbook of American churches, this is about the 1960 edition, we read this. From 1941 to 1961, the churches of Christ grew at the rate of 580%. Now, once again, maybe you don't know that much about math. You know what that means? We was talking about growing in 20 years and doubling in size. Right here, we've got almost growing by the number six. Between 1940 and 1960, first time I preached this sermon, there were some preachers and some elders in the audience as I was holding a meeting. They jump right astraddle me as soon as the service is over saying, your figures are inflated. I said, okay, uh, drop it down to what? You want to drop it down to 480%? 380%. How about 280%? And who are you to question the figures that appeared in a book that didn't have anything to do with members of the body of Christ for sure? But they simply tabulated and came up with a figure 580% that the Lord's church grew during that period of time in which debates were held 
in almost every locality on a regular basis and truth was shown to be truth and error was exposed as being error and sometimes whole man-made religious organizations left their denominational backgrounds and obeyed the gospel. That's what happened. When brethren were taking advantage of mass media, of radio, of the newspaper, and they were regularly exposing the error that people were believing and obeying that didn't do one thing to save their soul. And the church was growing at such a rate as that. The Lord is able to give you more than this, said the prophet Amaziah. That reminds me of another principle. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 35, Samuel is mourning for Saul. Of course, Saul ends up dead, of course. The kingdom has been taken from him. He started off fine, but he ended up bad, of course. He rebelled against God. He disobeyed God's instructions and all that, and so he loses the kingdom. So Samuel, naturally, is mourning for Saul. God says to Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? I mean, a little bit of mourning is all right, but you got stuff to do. Get up. Get busy. Anoint this fellow who's the son of Jesse. His name is David to be king. And quit mourning. There are things to do. How many times have brethren, how many times have we been guilty of wringing our hands and saying, oh, what are we? Or we go and knock on the door and somebody tells us to get out and don't come in again and we fail to realize that right behind us was another door that they might let us in. How long will we mourn? Is there not something we can do? Let me tell you something. If you can't think of anything to do, go to the nursing home. Visit the nursing home. If you start feeling bad for yourself, say, oh man, oh, my back's killing me. Go to the nursing home. You'll be thankful you've got a back that hurts. I promise you. I promise you. We need to look at things differently. But our problems in our bones. Our bones appear to be dry. But they shouldn't be dry. We shouldn't have that attitude towards ourselves that there's absolutely no hope for us, that our hope is lost. Why is that? How could anybody get to the position where they're acting and speaking like the children of Israel when they were in bondage to the Babylonians? Friends, as long as we're alive, and last time I looked, everybody here is, there's still hope. We may feel as though we're simply occupying a pew presently, and if we're satisfied with occupying a pew, and that's all, then that's what we'll continue to do. But if we really want to be a, a benefit for good in this community and for the Lord's cause, then we'll do more than simply warm a pew. We'll take the gospel wherever we go. Somebody says, well, Freddie, you know, I'll tell you about that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I remember the, I, I've heard about the church going like that back there in the back there in the forties and the fifties, you know. And there were parts of of that those two decades that I remember a little bit, you know. And there's tent meetings, you know. And I'm, I mean, we even had one here in in nineteen in the sixties, and and Harvey Starling up here, and it went from Sunday to Sunday to Sunday. And there are people right here in this audience tonight who obeyed the gospel and were restored during that effort that many years ago, and have stayed faithful all these years. But we're not going like that anymore. So why not? Why are we not growing like they were growing? We were growing back then. Somebody says, what's well, got to be our bones? Our bones have to be dry. Our hope has to be lost. Our bones are so separated from each other that they'll never get back together again. So it's got to be in our bones. Well, how come we think like this? And how come it is the case, honestly, that we're not growing like that? Here's the reason. The reason is the second point. It's because of the pudding. Because of the pudding? Yeah, it's because of what we've been eating for all these years, since the early 60s. You see, the problem with our bones, our outlook, is based upon what we have been fed, oftentimes from the pulpit, oftentimes from our Bible classes. We've been fed a steady diet of non-confrontational, non-necessary ingredients, and thus we have corrupted the true blue influence of the gospel and have made it nothing more than good housekeeping. 
sack. It's because of what we've been eating that we're not growing like we did. And here's some of the attitudes that people have. Man, I've heard this the whole time I've been preaching. When I, was, when I first started preaching, I heard older people say this. Well, when you get older, you'll tone down. What that mean? When you get older, you'll quit preaching as straight and as black and white as you do now? Let me tell you something. The scripture is just as black and white now as when I first started preaching. The truth is just as distinctive now as it's ever been, as it was on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The truth has the ability to cut and divide the very soul of an individual. It exposes dishonesty. But it's, it's not ever given the opportunity to do that. And a steady diet of sweet nothings is presented as if it is the gospel. There ain't nobody going to be saved. What possible good could result when people lost and condemned leave our buildings week after week after week and never feel guilty about being lost? What good has been accomplished? Nothing. Nothing. Somebody says, well, you're, you're just trying to put people on a guilt trip. No, I'm trying to put people on a guilt trip. Let me ask you something. On Day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, there were, there were at least 3,000 people who were made to feel so guilty that they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And if they had not been made to feel the enormity of the sin of contributing to the death of the Son of God, if they were not made to feel guilty, they wouldn't have said a thing. But they did. And we're thankful they did. It is the purpose of gospel preaching to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And that's what must be done. Somebody says, we can't preach like that. We can't preach today like preachers preached back then. I mean, old Harvey Starling, he was, there was slobber and sweat going everywhere when he was about to me. Yeah. And people who were lost felt lost. How's lost people supposed to feel anyhow? I submit they're supposed to feel lost so that if they might do something about it to soothe their conscience and be able to pillow their head at night and not feel bad about themselves. Should people be so stirred by the gospel that they call an elder or a preacher at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, meet me at the church building, I can't stand anymore, I obey the gospel. But the present situation in many pulpits is they never feel that way. Because the distinctive nature of New Testament Christianity is not being presented. We can't preach like that. Why not? Why can't we preach? It will offend people and run them off. Oh, really? Oh, really? There's another side to this pudding business I want to look at real quick. And it's a saying that we use oftentimes, the proof's in the pudding. Okay, let's look at the proof. You know, you can't preach like that anymore. You need to tone down your message. You don't want to run people off. Well, there's a couple of generations who bought into that stuff. Now, here's the statistics from 41 to 61. 580% growth when we were preaching cut and dried gospel messages. Then what happened between 1979 and 1997, about a 20 year period too. Now we can figure this out and check this out by simply looking at a book in our library. When we were told the way that we are to present ourselves to the world and the gospel of the world is to win friends and influence people. Then what happened during that period of time? Well here's how we grew. We grew during that 18-year period of time at a 0.012% rate. Whoa. You know what that translates to? That translates to one member being added to each congregation over that whole 18-year period of time. Now, what's the reason why we couldn't preach like that? We're going to run them off. Who's to run off? Who's to run off? One, that's not one person a year. That's one person in the totality of the 18 years. Something's wrong. I mean, it don't take a genius to figure out what it is that is wrong. Now look at the results. I mean, real statistical results of swallowing that pudding, of not being so distinctive, of not making people feel uncomfortable, even though they should be uncomfortable because they're not prepared for death and eternity, then where did that take us? Well, it took us to the point where nobody's growing anymore because of a watered-down, worthless message that could be preached anywhere 
and at any time and nobody would feel any different about it. Sadly. The facts tell us that mentality is not effective. Now very quickly. I made this distinction even before Dave Miller put it in his book, Piles in the Strait. He says concerning the last hundred years or so, there have been four stages of our history during the last hundred years. The first phase was when, back there in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, there was a spoken understanding of a distinction that exists between genuine New Testament Christianity and stuff that had been started and propagated by man. It was a clear distinction. Nobody had any trouble understanding it because it was regularly taught from the pulpit. It was regularly a lesson that was presented in a gospel meeting. It was regularly a part of our Bible class material. There was a spoken understanding. Everybody knew it because we talked about it. And the reason why we talked about it is because we didn't want people to die lost and not a member of the body of Christ. That's why. But then we went to a second area. And during this second area, there were people who said, you know what, we know this, so we don't have to talk about it all the time. I mean, sometimes it seems though the preacher is preaching that same lesson about comparing the Lord's church and man-made church. It seems like he's preaching that at least once a year. Well, we don't need to hear it. We understand that. We know that. And so let's get away from doing that distinctive preaching all the time. And some preachers agreed and quit. But during that time, though, there was an understanding. People knew it. It just wasn't mentioned all the time. But then, lo and behold, there was a generation that was growing up during that period of time, and they didn't hear that distinctive message like their parents did. I mean, they didn't hear it in their Bible classes from this high on up. They didn't hear it in the pulpit. They didn't hear it at gospel meetings. And so they simply observed what was going on and ends up they're classified as having an unspoken Misunderstanding. I mean, they just looked around. They said, "You know what? You know, we got these, uh, we got this uh, Sequatchie Valley Fellowship of Churches, you know, and and here are here are uh, preachers and and uh, uh, among us that are hobnobbing with these uh, different religious groups, and we got." We got softball teams, and we're playing softball against the Baptist and the Methodist, and, and we've got all these things. Well, maybe there is no distinction between us. Maybe we're, we're all going to the same place, just traveling different roads. Well, that's a bunch of baloney. But by observation, that's what they thought. Why do they think that? Because they were not hearing it in the pulpit. They were not hearing it in their Bible classes. It was not a message that was preached during gospel meetings. And so they drew the wrong conclusion... But as long as you're a nice person and don't kill more than one or two people and you're really sorry for that, then everybody's going to go to heaven anyhow. And if they went to any funerals, they know nobody dies lost. Nobody does. The greatest remedy for sin ever invented was death. Because at death, everybody's slate is wiped clean. And the devil dances with glee. Because that's a lie. And that's the third lie. But then we've made it to our day in which not only is there a misunderstanding, there is a flat-out spoken misunderstanding. I mean, you hear it in the pulpit. You have books that are written by brethren promoting this garbage. You have teachers in universities that don't know the difference between a man-made religious organization and the Lord's church. And they are, in fact, infiltrating the minds of people that we send there, trusting them to tell them the truth. There is a spoken misunderstanding where we begin with a spoken understanding. Wow. It happened just like that. Just like that. Well, I don't want to leave us negatively. So the last point of our three-point sermon has to do with nets. Nets. We're not growing like we used to be. That's true. We're not growing like we used to because of the pudding we've swallowed and actually believed what's been fed to us. We're not going to do that anymore. Well, what's the significance of nets? Well, here it is. There's hope all around us. And we illustrate this lesson with the nets that we read about in Luke chapter 5. You remember in Luke chapter 5, here's some professional fishermen who have been fishing all night and ain't caught a thing. And the Lord arrives on the scene. He says, boys, launch out into the deep 
and let down your nets. Now, as a professional fisherman would think, we do this for a living, you know. We've tried everything we know. We ain't caught anything. But here's the Lord. And the Lord says, go ahead and launch out the deep and let out your nets. Well, that's what Peter does. Simon Peter answered and said to the Lord, Master, we've toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Now, I don't know if there's a, this distinction is really a distinction that matters, but it does seem to be a distinction to me that I think we make a point about. The Lord didn't say do that. The Lord said, let out your nets, plural. And is it possible that this old professional fisherman here thinks he knows more than the Lord does, but to accommodate him, you know, to be nice to him, you know. I, I mean, I do this for a living. But since it's you, Lord, I'll go ahead and cast out my net. I mean, you know what happened? There were so many fish, they had to get help to bring them all in. Maybe, maybe just maybe, the Lord knows more about this than the so-called professional fisherman knows about this. Reckon that's possible? Could be. The question that we could ask right here and what the Lord could I ask of these fishermen is this. Why not just do what the Lord said do? And does that not apply to us as well? Why don't we just do what the Lord said do? Cast out your nets and then you'll have a whole bunch more fish than just casting out your net. It all comes down to this one verse of Scripture that I want us to end with, Acts chapter 14, verse 1. And this is talking about the exploits of Paul and Barnabas. Notice the significance of some small word, a small word in this passage. And it came to pass in Iconium that they, and that's Paul and Barnabas, went both into the, together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude both of Jews and also of Greeks believe. Think about that, okay? Here these two guys go into the synagogue and they so speak. Now the soul has reference to the manner of their speaking. They speak in such a way that what happens? Jews know that they can't stay Jews and be saved. They got to obey the gospel. Gentiles, Greeks know, they can't follow the religion of their forefathers. They can't be idol worshipers. They've got to obey the gospel too. Lost people hear the soul speaking to the extent that they feel the enormity of their sins and they correctly respond to the gospel and are saved. They so speak. Did you know there is just as much salvation down here at the McDonald's as there is in any man-made religious organization? Amen. None. There is none. And if people do not hear us so speaking that and proving that to be the case from God's Word, they ain't going to change. Why would they? Friends, we've got to be so speaking. We have to be making it clear, plain, because souls are in the Bible. If this didn't matter, then we wouldn't be talking about it. But because it does matter, it has direct correlation not only to our souls, but those as well that we present the gospel to. We've got to be busy in preaching the gospel and give people the opportunity to either accept it and obey it or reject it. But let's give them that opportunity. God has still plan. Begins with hearing. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. If we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, surely then we would be willing to repent of our sins, confess the name of Christ, so that we then might be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, at which time the Lord will add us to His church. Then, after obeying the gospel, then simply be faithful. Not perfect, but faithful. If you're wayward and not faithful, then why not come back home through repentance, confession, and prayer? If you're subject to heaven's invitation anyway, let us know how we can assist you while together we stand and while we sing.